Okay guys, welcome back. Today we are covering caching. So we will briefly explain how websites work, front end versus back end, permanent storage versus memory, and we'll discuss exactly where caching is going to live. I'll explain caching and demonstrate a speed difference. We'll even discuss the advantages and disadvantages of caching, as well as cache management, specifically evicting the cache. We will cover the following annotations, enable caching, cacheable, cache evict, and cache put. And we are using the default caching available to us in Spring Boot. So you should probably already know this if you've gotten this far in the course, but let's just make sure everyone's up to speed. So on the far left, we have our user. In our case, we're using Postman as a substitute for the user. It will make HTTP requests to the server. Now we don't have a live server. We have our Java code running in our local host and it uses Tomcat, which is a fake development server. And that lives in RAM, random access memory. Then it will make queries to the database using SQL queries. Or in our case, it might be using Hibernate. When we do a repository.save, it's using Hibernate, which then converts it to a SQL query so it can go to the database. The database is living in permanent storage, so it could be an SSD, it could be a hard drive. The database will then communicate back to the server. We load it into RAM or memory, and then we respond back to Postman or the user with an HTTP response. So the challenge with this model is even though computers operate very quickly, it's actually too slow for certain applications. Specifically, when we're looking at the server in the middle, talking with the database, this can be very slow and intensive. So when we cache something, we're going to load something from the database and have it live here in the RAM so that when a user or postman goes to the server, we check to see, do we already have this value? And if we do, we don't bother going to the database and doing some computation. Instead, we just return it straight back to the user. So this can increase speed and decrease latency dramatically. I do think it's worthwhile to take a moment and talk about the cache data structure. So cache is a hash map. It takes in the method and parameters and generates a unique hash, which represents the key of the hash map. It then stores the return of the method call in the value. So when a request comes in, Spring Boot checks the cache to see if the hash already exists. If yes, the method call doesn't execute. Spring Boot instead just returns the value. So it doesn't speed up the method, it just returns the value. And because of this, we can get some squirrely results depending on exactly what we're doing because we were expecting the method to execute and it never did. And just FYI, there are alternatives to Spring's built-in cache. So a cache, I hope I'm saying that right. Caffeine, that's the one my workplace uses. Redis, Hazelcast, Guava Cache. And as an aside, some of these use hash maps plus another data structure. So sometimes they will pair it with a linked list or a tree, or in the case of Redis, all three. How they do this is outside the scope of today's discussion, so let's move on to pros and cons. So pros, of course, it's much faster. It reduces database usage. So you can think of the database as a potential bottleneck. So let's say multiple users are trying to use the database all at once. Well, if you cache one user's data, then not only will it be faster for them, but let's say another user that does need to use the database, they can get in faster. So caching doesn't just help the one user, it could help everyone in the system. It can also reduce wear and tear on your database. So databases actually have a limited number of reads and writes, and the more reads and writes you do over time, the quicker you will have to replace parts of your database. And it can actually save energy. Uh, if you're doing a very complex computation and getting data from a bunch of different places in SQL, that could use a lot of energy. And if it's already available, well, that work has already been done. So cons, of course, it's an increased amount of complexity. So developers will have to do more work and be more thoughtful about what they put in the cache and when to get rid of the cache. You could have stale data. So let's say you load something into cache and then someone comes in later and updates your product. Well, now the value you have in cache is different from the value that you had in the database, and you could still be serving the old data. So we'll have to think of ways on how we can update the cache when certain methods are called. It uses more memory, so if we're using less database, then we are using more memory. 
the cache is lost if the power goes out or if you restart the system. As opposed to permanent storage of MySQL Server, if the power goes out, if you reboot it, all your data is still there, but not with cache. And lastly, there are warm-up times. So caching only works if you're querying the database for the same thing in the same way. The first time you call it, it's not going to be any faster because you still have to execute the method. You only save time on subsequent calls. So here are a few examples of when you would want to use cache. So a frequent read operation, perhaps a popular YouTuber uploads and 100 million people watch it in the first 24 hours. That would be very taxing on your database and very slow for the user. If you have a very expensive computation that has to do a lot of things in SQL, uh, data that doesn't change frequently. If it doesn't change out from under you, then you might as well keep it in a place that's closer to the user. You want to use it when performance matters, and you also want to use it when your database load matters. Okay, let's get started on the code. Okay, before we do any caching work, let's go ahead and run our application, and let's just get a baseline to see how quickly our system is running and compare it to after we add in the caching. So I'm going to go ahead and do get product with an ID of one. And if you look, we have a 200 status and it took 266 milliseconds. However, this does not count. The first time you ping Spring Boot after it just launched actually takes a lot longer because it has to load some beans into memory. This doesn't count. We need to go ahead and run it again. Okay, so we are getting 13 milliseconds, and that's better. Let's run it a few more times. So we have 11, 17, 13, 13, 12. So we'll say 13 is right about the average for our baseline. So coming back to our application, we'll go ahead and stop the application. And underneath our Spring Boot application annotation, we are going to add the annotation, enable caching and make sure you choose the Spring Boot caching import. So making our way over to our controller, we have a bunch of mappings, some get mappings, a post, a put, and a delete. We're gonna start off by caching our get mapping on our ID. So if you haven't seen our previous videos, basically this is a get mapping, so slash products, slash ID, it returns a product DTO, we grab the ID from the URL, and then we pass it into our query handler, and all we do is a find by ID. If the product is empty, we throw an exception, and then we just convert it to a DTO and send it back to the user. So pretty straightforward and simple stuff. So here we're gonna add an annotation, at cacheable, and make sure to import the correct annotation, springframework.cache. We're going to name it product cache. Let's go ahead and run our application. So go ahead and hit this endpoint again, and we get 353 milliseconds. Again, the first one you run doesn't count. Running it again, now we're getting six milliseconds. Five, six, five, seven. So we've cut the time about in half. It went from 13 to about six to seven. But we have a problem. So we just got this back with a price of $499.99, but what happens if we change it out from under us? So making our way over to our put request, I'm going to change the price to $199, flash sale. So it updated our database. Now let's do the get product again. So it was at $499 click send, and it's still showing 499. So it did not update. This is stale data. And you can tell because the time is still six milliseconds really fast. So how do we address this? Well, first, let's stop our project. Going back to our product controller, the method that handled the update is down here, update product. So we have a put mapping, we pass in an ID to the URL, and a product to the request body. We just combine those two things into a command, and then we pass that command into our update product query handler. So pretty simple stuff. We do a similar thing. We find the product by ID. If we can't find it, we throw an exception, 
we set the values and then we save it and then return a 200 back to the user. So what we want to do is when this method is executed, we want the cache to be evicted. We no longer want that stale value. So we're going to say at cache evict. The value is going to be the name of the cache we previously assigned. So product cache, comma, and then we need to define our key. So our key, we're going to use the spring expression language, so hashtag, and then we do command.getID. So what's happening here is it's looking inside this method, looking for a what unique identifier that was passed into this method tells it to cache. So command.getID, that was the unique identifier. This is really important because no matter what ID we pass into this method, we still want it to work. So let's rerun our application, making our way back over to Postman. So let me do a get on the product endpoint again and see what we get. So 199, good. Remember the cache got completely deleted when we stopped our program. Now that we restarted it, we got the correct data. And remember, this first request doesn't count. Spring had to initialize a bunch of stuff. So let's rerun it a few times. So eight milliseconds, seven, six, five. Now let's go ahead and update our product. So we're gonna change it from 199 to 1199. Going back to our get product, we should get 1199. And we do. So we successfully evicted the cache and actually ran the method. However, there is one more problem. If you look, it took 21 milliseconds to complete this operation. This tells us it was not in cache, even though we just updated the method. So we need to do one more thing. If we just return the update method, we should also return the cache. So if I run this a few more times, it is now cached and we are getting the quick result. So making our way back over to the project, we're going to change cache evict to cache put. Cache evict just throws it away. Cache put puts it in place, so it gets rid of it and replaces it. Now here's the key. Whatever the return value of this method is, that's what we put in the cache, even if it doesn't make any sense. And to demonstrate, I'm gonna do a response entity dot okay here and I'm going to pass in hello world to the body which is nonsensical we should be returning the product but let's go ahead and run this so if we do the get endpoint we're still getting the correct thing 1199 and it is cached let's go ahead and update our product we'll say 199 again and we got back hello world which is not what we should have gotten back but here's one more key point. If we go back to our get product, we get back hello world, which is not the product. So whatever we shove into the cache, even if it doesn't make sense, that's what it will return. So here, even though we're doing an update, we still need to return a product. So new product ETL, and we're going to pass in the product. That way it saves the correct thing to the cache when this is called. Rerun again. So if we do a get, we get the correct thing, 199. Let's update. We'll change it to 1999, perhaps by accident. We got the correct return value. And now when we go to get product, We get the correct thing, and it was cached. We got a time of only eight milliseconds. Okay, thank you for joining us. This covers our introduction to caching. On the next episode, we will talk more about the cache manager and how to do this in a more elegant, reusable type of way.